Today, we're talking about Habwa, the man with the three O's. More specifically, we're talking about the problems that people have with Habwa. When I look in the comment section, a reoccurring theme is that when people complain about Gaas, somehow Habwa always gets mentioned. From a Conquest player's perspective, this can be a little irritating, because knowing that he is not very high up in the meta at all and is usually not favored either as a mid or a jungle pick, kind of indicates to us that he's maybe not the strongest god out there. So we have two clashing perspectives here, and in this video I want to bring both of them together a little bit and talk about what may give off the perception that Habwa is very strong and what may give off the perception that he's not very strong. So first of all, let's talk about Habwa's frustration points for those playing against him. He's got three abilities that we look at here, the joke with the three ultimates not coming out of nowhere, which are all somehow regarded as very strong for various different reasons, and they all have a certain aspect that makes them feel very strong. For the first ability, Water Cannon, that is the incredibly low cooldown of 3 seconds before any cooldown reduction. That means no matter what build, this ability is very spammable. Often you'll be able to use it twice during a fight, or potentially even more. His second ability that is annoying is Water Spout, his 3. This ability is hard to read as it doesn't have a projectile but comes out of the ground, while being one of the strongest or the strongest CC in the game, a knockup, something you can really not do much against, which can always feel frustrating. Crushing Wave is his ultimate and kind of overall a bit more towards the frustrating side due to the fact that it has relatively high base damage, very high scaling and it's also a big AoE ability. Different from other mage ultimates, it's also almost instant which makes it very easy for him to confirm the damage if an enemy is in range. Now on the other hand, there are obviously also downsides to Habwa. One is in his mobility. The only real escape that he has is in his ultimate and even that is not the best kind of escape that it doesn't go through walls or anything. Other than that, he has his carpet, but the carpet is not really a normal escape tool as such. It does cleanse slows since recently, but it doesn't even come close to any other movement ability like a leap, for example, which can get you over walls and create an immediate distance. So generally speaking, he has very limited mobility. He also has very short range if he wants to do any major damage outside of his basic poke with water spout. And that comes with the additional attribute of being very squishy, meaning that he can get killed quite easily if he gets close to the enemy. As such, many situations for Habwa are basically kill or be killed. You want to get in the face of the enemy as quickly as possible, while making sure that the enemy doesn't do too much damage to you while you're doing that. This is why Blink is a very often purchased relic on him, as it allows him to reposition himself without having the normal mobility abilities that others have, and will give him the leverage of being in the enemy's face before they even expect it, maybe using the ultimate or the knockup and then the ultimate before they can counterplay it. And that especially leads to one thing, snowballing. Habua in himself is a very snowbally character. If you get an early lead and you can afford to be close to the enemy and punish them for staying around you and kill them before they can kill you, then you will probably extend that lead quite easily. On the other hand, if you fall behind early and you get killed, then you will be punished for that even harder after that, as you will have to get close to the enemy to deal damage, but every time you get close to the enemy, you'll pretty much die. The gameplay footage of the two games you see in the background kind of reflects that, and one I got behind early on, especially because we had a DC, so I did not get any fights where I had a leverage over the enemy, I was usually playing from behind, and that made Habwa feel very, very weak, and if this was the only game that I had with him, I would have thought that he's a rather weak god. In the other game, you see the opposite, I get ahead early on and I can snowball from there and at some point I can pretty much do whatever I want to as I have so much higher damage output than any of the enemies that they can't really contest me anymore unless I majorly misplay. Gods like this being disliked is nothing that is unfamiliar or uncommon to smite at all. The most disliked gods by beginners are gods like Loki, Anubis and Zeus and all of them kinda revolve around this concept of burst someone before they burst you, especially Anubis as a prime example here and it's up to the player to learn how to counterplay them. Eventually, most people are not that frustrated with Anubis anymore because they kind of get used to what he does, but some will struggle with him for the rest of their days simply because they will allow him to get ahead and then pop them from there. As such, I feel a little bit like Habwa is to slightly advanced players what Anubis is to absolute beginners. Now, before we get to the next segment, it's worth noting that there is the aspect of gold spooling and farm in general between different game modes. Habwa's main game mode is not Conquest, it's not the mode where he's most successful by all impressions I've gotten so far. Maps like the Joust map are a lot more favorable for him because it's much easier to land his ultimate there and to get the reliable poke off that he has, so that overall puts him in a better spot to begin with. 
Likewise, in Arena he will get a lot more gold and a lot more XP much quicker. And the later you get into the game, the better for Habois, as he has these high scalings and he has this relatively high base values. And if you get some CDR on top of the short cooldowns he already has, then you can abuse that even more. So there's a lot of benefits in that. At the same time, he gets none of these in Conquest. He has a lot less room to decide where he has to fight the enemy and he has to take every opportunity he gets. He can get punished much harder because the early game is much longer, he will get less farm it will take longer and the more he falls behind the worse he gets and you can make someone fall behind more in a mode where they have to farm their own golden xp more than getting it through spooling so overall conquest is just a map that doesn't favor him in that regard along with other factors in the meta like for example enemies building relatively tanky which he can't burst through items like Ancelia getting popular and him lacking the mobility for jungle but also lacking the ranged damage for mid in order to play either of them very safely means that he's more of a niche pick or a comfort pick that will not be played as often and is not considered as viable. Regarding the question of his damage values and if he has too much damage, it is worth noting that he's very hard to compare to others. For example, Vulcan is one of the guards he's often compared to, but that doesn't really make sense because Vulcan has an extra damage ability over him and his ultimate also is a very long range. Anubis, for example, has way more damage than Habwa, but Anubis' damage is ticking, so it's much, much easier to avoid. Others, like Janus, who kind of come close to damage in some regards, have other perks like much longer range, once again, or they have heals in their kit that will help them. In return, Habwa has his shorter cooldowns, but it's something that makes all of these abilities very hard to compare. Which puts him in a very unique position, whereas, for example, one of the few mages that can jungle very, very well and is very viable as a jungler with his low cooldown, short range, clear. But I know some of you will really want that number comparison, and I will give you one here, and that's a number comparison with a current high tier mage that is by most considered borderline overpowered, and that is Raijin. If we look at the damage values here, Habra has 290 plus 80% scaling on his 1, where Raijin has 360 plus 120% scaling. Habua has some benefits here, like the much shorter cooldown, and also the fact that he needs one hit compared to Raijin's three hits, but we get to that later. Habua's two doesn't do any damage, it's just a utility ability, whereas Raijin's two does 275 plus 65% damage. That's more comparable to Habua's three, 280 damage plus 85% scaling, where Raijin, on top of that, has another 120 base damage plus 40% scaling. And then comparing the ults, where there's always the biggest complaint point for Habois, 690 base damage plus 115% scaling. Raijin, on the other hand, if you hit all four shots, has 960 damage and 200% scaling. So across the board, Raijin has more damage, but his abilities are also harder to confirm, but he also has longer range. If we look at the total damage values, we have 102,060 base damage on Habois, plus 280% scaling and 1,715 base damage on Raijin with 425% scaling. Massive lead for Raijin here. We can obviously say something like looking at the numbers that Habois would hit another one, but even that would still lead to Raijin coming out on top. And once again, Raijin is just a lot safer in how much range he has for his abilities and how safely he can trigger multiple of them and how much he can just do without being in his enemy's face while also having a much more reliable escape that can go over walls. This is not to say that Hawa's damage values aren't high, they are high for a reason, they are high because he has to be close to the enemy and gets punished easily, but I wanted to show that his damage numbers are maybe not as ridiculous as he's often painted when put in perspective to other mages. After all, he still has less base damage and less scaling than Scylla as well, so it's really not that over the top. Sure, there are weaker mages like the Scordia, but Habwa is not at the top end of the damage spectrum. So, now that we've looked at the numbers a little bit and talked about how he functions, what can you do against Habwa? First of all, he has to be in close range. If you're a hunter, you have no reason to get close to him. Try to poke him before he can even blink, and he's pretty much out of options already. He can range poke you with his 3, he can probably not close the distance with his ultimate if you position yourself well, and that's about it. You'll probably back out or try to get out of combat for his blink, and your job is just to keep him in combat and you can quite easily kill him in most situations. What can help any range characters with that is trying to figure out how he uses his water spout. If you see a bit of a pattern there, see if he often throws it a bit to the right of you, to the left of you, if he follows your motion or not, you will be able to juke that better and when you juke that better, all of his setup is gone. A second important point, again to counter and blink as well, is to engage before he does. Especially if you're an assassin or a tankier character, you want to be in his face at all times. 
while this is where he's strongest, is also where he's weakest. It will force him to use his ultimate defensively if he wants to get away from you, and if you rotate or circle around him quickly, then he will have a harder time hitting his other abilities as well, as his 3 has a short windup and his 1 is a cone ability, and if you played Ymir before, you know that the cone ability is harder to hit if someone is really close to you where the cone is smaller. No matter what game mode you're playing, it's incredibly important to decimate Habwa in the early game. Pre-level 12, he will either have no beats or he will have no blink. And one of those will be his downfall. Either he cannot engage freely and escape in clutch situations where he gets out of combat, or he has no crowd control immunity outside of his ultimate. And whenever Hobois doesn't have his ultimate, his kill potential sinks drastically. Between his 1 and his 3, the poke is usually not enough to kill someone, but rather just to take off a chunk of their health. But not only can you abuse the fact that he will be lacking one relic, he also will not have as much mana. And that makes his one a lot less spammable, making it more of an issue for him to even sustain through the laning or the trading phase, depending on the game mode. Also, when trading Habois, finish him quickly. Do not look for extended trades with him. Get in, drop your abilities, hope he's dead and if he's not, get out and try again later. Through his passive he gets 5% extra power per ability used, and if you keep trading him he will constantly have that up. Additionally, not many characters can compete with the cooldown of his 1, so unless you're maybe a hunter or a AA assassin, you will be in a very awkward spot after a short time. I want to repeat this once more in full clarity, play against him with your whole team. If you collapse on Harbois, he cannot do much unless you're all standing in a line and he can ult all of you at once. And you can do that over and over until he's so far behind that there's not much he can do anymore. And this works in any game mode. As for counter items, there are four. The most important one is Aegis. If you use this, it will allow you to prevent his ultimate damage. And avoiding that damage means he has a much, much weaker fighting position against you. Habwa can counter that by knocking you up with a 3 and then ulting you, but usually that won't even be the case as you will see them blink on you and then ult you, so they can basically catch you in a surprise moment and don't have to try and land the 3 first. Furthermore, there's Magi's Blessing that can even prevent this particular situation from happening as he will immune his knockup then. The one item that almost kicked Habwa out of the dual meta for a while is Bulwark of Hope. Not only does it give you a ridiculous amount of health and magical protection, it also furthermore gives you a shield on top of that to soak up a massive amount of burst, especially against characters like Habois. This means that he will often have to choose another target, especially until he gets Obsidian Shard. Last but not least, there's Winged Blade as a secondary counter if the slow is what's hindering you, though in most situations you should be able to just avoid the carpet entirely, but it can help as it also has some extra health, and if you don't fully just want to counter him, it can be a very useful item overall. In conclusion, I personally think Habwa is not as strong as Painted and there are many ways to counterplay him. And I hope this video helps you with exactly those things, so you will be a little bit less frustrated when playing against Habwa. With that, thank you guys very much for watching. If you're not subscribed yet and you enjoyed this kind of content, feel free to click the sub button and maybe the bell, it really helps me out. It gives you the chance to get some codes which I dropped in the description or the comment section sometimes. Also, I'd like to point out again that I'm streaming on Twitch TV slash Duke Sloth. I will have a schedule again soon and I'd like to throw it out there sometimes, as I know some people are not aware of that. See you for the next one tomorrow. Duke Sloth, out.